Oh, well, I was attracted by the idea that Dick Feynman and I would collaborate on things, and we did for a number of years. Yes, he was there. He, in fact, invited me to Caltech. He, uh, he persuaded the department to uh, hire me. He, uh, he was quite impressed with some of the pieces of work that I had uh, done. One was the, uh, what's now called the renormalization group, work with Francis Law. Uh, which we carried out in the hot summer at the <laughs> University of Illinois. Uh, and Dick said that was the, this was the only piece of work on quantum electrodynamics uh, that he'd ever seen that he hadn't any inkling of. Mm -hmm. And he got quite excited about it and actually extended the results a little bit. It also revealed some errors in a number of calculations that people had made because uh, we had we had a, a we knew what certain fourth order terms looked like in the expansion of uh, quantum electrodynamics and some of the papers uh, didn't get them right. Uh, but anyway, we did work together for a few years and it was very pleasant. It was very exciting. We uh, would bounce ideas off each other and call each other at odd times of day and night and uh, try things and then find they didn't work and then try other things and find they did work and so on. It was, it was quite fun. But uh, after a while, his preoccupation with himself and his own image began to get on my nerves. I mean, he was a very good scientist, but he spent a great deal of his effort on uh, generating anecdotes about himself. And uh, whenever we did anything together, he would somehow think of it as, as his work. <laughs> it's not that he didn't appreciate me. He actually admired me a great deal. But uh, somehow he just couldn't uh, keep his own ego out of everything, out, out of anything, actually. And finally, it got on my nerves, and then I just couldn't work with him anymore. Yeah, well, he just, he spent so much effort generating stories about himself. It was unbelievable. And uh, he insisted on uh, being different, always. His father had taught him that. His father, who died when he was fairly young, taught him always to be different. Well, frequently, in many cases, uh, it's not, doesn't pay to be different. Doing the regular thing is okay. Uh, for instance, uh, he advocated on national television not, uh, that people not brush their teeth, or floss either, as far as I remember. Uh, and we shared the same uh, firm of dentists. And <laughs> I knew that they were having terrible trouble with his teeth. And they tried to persuade him to brush or floss or both, and he wouldn't do it. And they kept bringing in scientific papers showing that it was useful. <laughs> he kept saying it was just a superstition, and so on and so forth. It was kind of ridiculous. Uh, washing your hands after urinating was another thing that he felt was a superstition. And in fact, I think so too, uh, but in many cases, uh, I would be uh, in the bathroom, in the men's room, uh, just before lunch, just before walking over to the Athenaeum for lunch. And so if I uh, urinated, I also washed my hands because I was just getting ready for lunch. But he couldn't see that. He said, you're just, a, you're just an ordinary person. He said, you're just a salesman type. And, uh, you know, <laughs> he, whereas he was an independent thinker. He could see that one shouldn't wash one hand, one's hands under those conditions. Uh, all that kind of thing just gradually got on my nerves. He, uh, he had a, uh, a habit in the early years, uh, whenever he ate at the Athenaeum, the faculty club, he had a habit of walking over there without his jacket and tie, even though they required a jacket and tie. And even though he arrived for work every day wearing a jacket and tie, he would hang them up in his office and then walk over to the Athenaeum in his with his uh, shirt, uh, top shirt button unbuttoned, 
and uh, no jacket. And then when he got to the Athenaeum, because of the rule that they had at that time, he went into the, uh, man, to the cloakroom and uh, picked out one of the loud, disgusting-looking ties that they kept there for people who weren't properly dressed and the torn jacket that they kept there for people who weren't properly dressed. And he would put on the tie and the jacket and go into lunch that way, leaving his own tie and jacket back in the office.